Hello, it's Scott Manley here. I am, uh, well, I'm on my anniversary trip in Southern California, staying in Ventura, and people said you should go to the Point Mugu Missile Park, which is basically a park where they have a bunch of missiles on display, including a Polaris. Yes, a very early submarine-launched nuclear missile. In fact, they have an even earlier submarine-launched nuclear missile behind it. You might not recognize it, but between the Polaris and the F-14, that is a Regulus missile. Uh, so the Regulus was the first submarine-launched nuclear weapon that the US deployed, and it was deployed completely differently. And the idea is it would surface and it would launch one of these things. <laughs> like, so this is basically like a cruise missile, which would carry a nuclear warhead. And the interesting thing about it, I guess, is that it would be guided by radar. So they would have to have the submarine stay on the surface to guide it. But not only that, I think, I think they needed a second submarine to triangulate the actual point at which they would, uh, the death, you know, the missile was supposed to strike. So it would follow one radar beam and when it intercepted the other one, it was like, time to go nuclear. Uh, this was obviously not a particularly good way to start a war because uh, both submarines would be highly vulnerable. They would have to stay still on the surface providing this radar support while the missile was heading to its target. And then they wouldn't have much chance to get away after uh, afterwards. Yeah, that's uh, this is a cool one. I'm going to have to make a little video about it. Yeah. So before there was the Regulus, there was the Loon. It actually started out as a clone of the German V1. They actually discovered the German V1 in like 1942 when it ended up uh, landed on some island in the, the North Sea. The information made it to the US. They began to design their own version and the Loon was the naval version which was designed to be launched from a submarine. The Loon would have a range of about 150 miles with a one ton warhead. And they actually began building lots of these for the inevitable invasion of Japan. There was something like 1,300 built by the time World War II ended, but it was never actually used. And it wasn't just the Navy that would be interested. There was the U.S. Army Air Force, which actually developed an air-launched version of this you know, prototype cruise missile. This obviously had the advantage that it wouldn't need the JATO bottles to get its pulse jet engine up to speed. By the end of World War II, there was something like 22 different cruise missile projects uh, ongoing within the U.S. Armed Forces. One of which was a U.S. Navy contract awarded in 1943 to develop a missile that could carry a 4,000-pound warhead 300 miles. And honestly, this contract kind of went nowhere and was mostly forgotten until 1947 when the U.S. Air Force awarded a contract for the Matador missile, at which point the U.S. Navy decided that they'd better get in on the cruise missile game. Since its original inception, some of the concepts had changed. They now wanted a 3,000-pound warhead delivered to 500 miles, and that would handily deliver a nuclear warhead to the target. One of the big improvements over the Loon was that it used an Allison T-33 turbojet engine, which was vastly more efficient, enabling much longer range. This is pretty much the same design of jet engine that is used in those jets that are chasing it. And as a further point of comparison, the early versions actually were built with landing gear so that they could fly the airframe, you know, check the aerodynamics, check the guidance, check all the systems, and then recover the missile so that it could be used again later. For the first submarine test, the US Navy took the USS Tunney, which had been built in World War II as an attack submarine. They added a watertight hangar behind the sail, and that was where it would deploy from. Now, this wasn't integrated into the rest of the vessel. They would have to surface, the crew would get out from the tower, then they could open up the door, roll out the missile, go through the launch procedures and launch. And this wasn't terribly convenient, so the US Navy created the USS Greyback, which was constructed with a pair of missile hangars on the bow of the ship. Unfortunately, the Greyback was intentionally sunk in an exercise in the 1980s, but its sister ship, the Growler, is on display in New York next to the USS Intrepid, which is a pretty damn cool museum because it has the Space Shuttle Enterprise. And I have a whole other video if you're interested in the Enterprise. Anyway, both the Greyback and the Growler were still based on 1940s attack submarines. The only submarine that was actually built from day one to carry these missiles was the Halibut. 
And it had a far more automated system where it could roll everything out onto the deck and launch the missile without the crews having to get out there and you know move things around by hand. And the reason for the rarity of these submarines is, first of all, the task for which they were assigned left them so vulnerable, they were going to get destroyed. There was only one target they could hit, which was a Soviet naval base in uh, Kamchatsky, and because technology moved on. The Navy had recognised the deficiencies in the Regulus, and so they had were working on the Regulus II, which was a supersonic version with a much longer range, powered by a General Electric J-79. That's the same engine that powered the F-104 Starfighter and the F-4 Phantom. It could carry a W-27 nuclear warhead with a yield of 2 megatons over 1,000 miles, flying at an altitude of 59,000 feet and Mach 2. While it was successfully demonstrated and even performed submarine launches from the Greyback, it never entered into the, the arsenal because it was basically superseded by the Polaris. And the Polaris actually came as something of a surprise to the US Navy. It hadn't really been thinking about a missile this small. They had been talking, or rather working, with the US Army on the Jupiter missile. So Jupiter was about a 50-ton missile that could launch a 750-kilo W-49 warhead about 1,500 miles, you know, 2,400 kilometers. And while this was mostly being worked on by the Army team led by von Braun, the design was influenced by the Navy because they wanted a shorter missile so that it could fit inside a submarine. But the Navy really didn't like the idea that this was fueled by kerosene and liquid oxygen. And to be honest, I think one of the big reasons that the Navy persisted with this impractical weapon was that the US Air Force was working on the Atlas missile, and the Navy certainly didn't want to be left out of the ballistic nuclear missile game. A key moment in the inception of Polaris came at a submarine warfare conference, which had Edward Teller there, and he was sort of casually talking about shrinking down a nuclear warhead to fit into a torpedo, when I guess somebody realised if you can shrink down the warhead, we could make a smaller missile which would be easier to fit into a submarine. Now, Teller was prone to overstating capabilities and understating timetables, so, so they asked his counterpart over at Los Alamos, Dr. Mark, whether his claims of a one megaton warhead weighing 300 kilograms were possible, and immediately Dr. Mark was like, no, this isn't possible, but eventually he relented and said, you know, maybe, maybe a half megaton warhead in that form factor might be possible. This was his way of tempering expectations, but it was enough for the Navy to be convinced. They wanted this. And so by the end of the year, the Navy had ditched Regulus II, they had dropped out of Jupiter, and within five years, there were US submarines carrying Polaris missiles in patrol. So Polaris was a two-stage solid rocket uh, launcher. It was about 10 metres tall, which is slightly more than half the height of Jupiter. It was about 16 tonnes, making it like one-third the mass of Jupiter. It could throw the W-47 warhead 2,500 miles, making it longer range than Jupiter. And uh, that warhead was 600 kilotons initially, and then later 1.2 megatons. And of course, because it was solid propellant, it was much easier to handle on board a ship. It could just be put in a container. It didn't need active cooling or other sort of conditioning systems. And this in turn meant that the submarines could be a whole lot easier. They literally took a submarine that was being laid down as an attack sub and put a new section into it, making it 130 feet longer. And that was enough room for 16 missiles. That submarine would become the USS George Washington, which would be the surf, uh, first uh, ballistic missile submarine. Incidentally, the original submarine, which was modified, was actually laid down as the Scorpion. And you know, if you know anything about shipwrecks, you'll know that the Scorpion was lost at sea, and it is still a mystery as to why. Anyway, while the George Washington would be the first submarine to fire a Polaris missile... But it would be the USS Ethan Allen, which would perform the first entire end-to-end -end test of a Polaris nuclear weapon, launching it from the Pacific towards the target area, which was open ocean hundreds of miles from any inhabited area. There were a couple of submarines in the area that witnessed the explosion, and they triangulated it. They demonstrated that the warhead came within two kilometers of the target after flying through space. So Polaris would evolve, it would get more range, uh, new warhead options, decoys, and it would end up getting used by the British Royal Navy. One other really important advantage, which I haven't mentioned, was the fact that Polaris could be launched from underwater without the submarine surfacing. 
And to be clear, the Navy wasn't sure whether this was a possibility when they first uh, started the Polaris project. They were prepared to use them even if it required the submarine surfacing, but they investigated multiple methods for deploying the missile from underwater, either inside a case or on its own. In the end, they use a gas generator to create a lot of uh, you know gas that basically pushes it out of its tube above the surface and then it lights its engines. And you'll notice that in addition to having a whole lot of thrust, it also has thrust vectoring capability. And you can actually see how that works on the missile that was in the park. Yeah, the Polaris, uh, you can see in here the thrust vectoring system there. So while this is one big solid rocket motor, it would have four nozzles which could be steered in one axis. So four nozzles, one axis steering on each means that you get three axis control. So they can either, uh, the ones on each op opposite sides can uh, go in the same direction and that gives you either pitch or yaw, or, and they can also move in like a circular pattern and that gives you roll control. So you have three axis control in this first stage of this warp missile. At the time, the first stage of Polaris was the largest solid rocket motor ever developed. And it was built by Aerojet, the company that started out making those little JATO bottles which were used to launch the Loon and the Regulus missiles. So this small part of the launch process eventually replaced the entire missile and that's how we got modern submarine launch ballistic missiles. The Regulus would be decommissioned and would actually be turned into target drones for other projects. And the Navy would find other uses for the Greyback and the Growler with their watertight hangars. But that's another highly classified story. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.